My name is Lars Rudebeck, and I represent the DevNet Secretariat. The Secretariat is made up of two people, Heidi Moxness, who sits over there, and myself. And we have been in charge of, of uh, preparing this event. And we, as I said, we are excited to see so many people here. Yeah. An afternoon of discussion and debate over the concept of sustainability and uh, sustainable development. We're going to try to get at, to grasp the notion of sustainability. And Devnet, who is organizing this, is a project or a unit, we can say, a project within the Center for Sustainable Development. So it comes out very appropriately, doesn't it? And Devnet's task is to bring researchers of various disciplines all over Sweden together in, in <clears throat> to discuss and to find out and to do work on the relationships between nature, poverty and power and how these three together act upon and are influenced, well how they influence sustainable development, how sustainable development is affected by the interrelationship of nature, poverty and power. We also have a national committee consisting of colleagues from many universities in Sweden and over a year ago this national committee decided to have a debate on two crucial ways of approaching the notion of sustainability. Uh, we we want, want to bring out what we regard as key perspectives and compare them. And the two perspectives are resi resilience theory or the resilience approach and the political equality approach. We've decided, we tried to condense those two notions uh, in the announcement of the seminar. Let me just quote them because we worked a lot to, to, to boil down the essence of resilience theory and political ecology approaches to sustainable development. And so, so we say that resilience theory aims to analyze the capacity of social ecological systems to withstand shocks from phenomena, phenomena such as environmental degradation and climate change and to rebuild and renew themselves afterwards. In perspective, the one we call political ecology, it sees inherent conflicts in the quest for sustainability. Since socio-ecological systems at all levels are highly unequal. Conflicting interests and power relations must therefore, according to this second approach, be a key focus of the analysis. So we want to, to compare and perhaps bring together who knows, these two approaches or to see the differences between them. And in order to do that, we have invited two uh, distinguished representatives of these two ways of approaching sustainability. And uh, Gary Peterson of the Stockholm Resilience Center and Alf Humboy of the Human Ecology Division at Lund University. For, <coughs> and we are also very happy to have our colleague at CST, Eva Freeman, our close colleague, we sit in the same corridor. She has a here tonight, this afternoon, and Eva has accepted to be the moderator of this discussion between our two invited guests and between all of us here this afternoon. And uh, let me turn over the floor to Eva now and to Gary and, and uh, Alf to start off. The first part of the afternoon is going to be a scheduled debate between the two, where Gary starts out by presenting the ecology approach and Alf <coughs> continues and they are both going to have about 20 minutes each. And then afterwards we are going to have a coffee break to, to sort of absorb what we've heard and then come back here to, to debate and discuss. 
So please give up. And a very welcome. Thank you. Yes, I was going to tell you first about the, the afternoon, and you told them about the half of the afternoon. After the coffee break, which we will hear, have here in the lobby, um, first I will give the word then to Gary to co comment on Alf's presentation, and then uh, the word back, so you can discuss for a sh very short while. After that I have my own questions to pose, and I will do that before I let you in. But I think we will have, we have all in all, after the coffee break, one and a half hours, so you will have a lot good time, uh, a lot of time to debate and discuss with uh, our speakers, okay? Okay, so let me first then introduce Gary, who I haven't had the pleasure to meet before today, so I'm using my little note here. Um, Gary is professor in environmental sciences, as Lars said, at Stockholm Resilience Center, but has also a small part of his... Um, no, not anymore, okay. <laughs> I haven't looked at the internet, you know, it's a little bit old information. Um, his research, uh, anyway, focuses on social, socio-ecological resilience. And as far as I could see, you're theoretically based in complex systems theory, uh, synthesis of social ecological data, spatial analysis, and aim at contributing to a theory and practical understanding of uh, for a better management of ecosystems, is that right, more or less? Uh, Gary has a background in systems design engineering and a PhD in sociology. Has been a lot of other, other things too, and uh, apart from being at the Stockholm Resilience Center, he's also a member of several scientific boards and editorial boards, and has authored many articles, scientific articles and books. Right? Or book chapters at least. Gary, I'll give you now 20 minutes. So we, we are a little early, that's good. And uh, please, welcome. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to try and... Is this mic? Yes. Is that working? Okay. So, so what... I prefer to stand up. But uh, what I'm going to try and do is give a quick introduction to resilience. And basically my talk is going to speed through a bunch of things. But it's going to start off by talking about why would you want to think about resilience then try and explain what resilience is, and then very briefly talk about some ways I see resilience connecting with political ecology. And just to start at the, the start, uh, I don't see it there being a choice of, of resilience or political ecology. I, I believe that it should be resilience and political ecology. So, why resilience? Well, resilience is basically interesting because the world, especially in the 20th century, has not been interested in resilience. It's been interested in simplifying the world, making it more legible, reducing diversity to optimize what people can get out of this. For people in different backgrounds, this could be called high modernism, as James Scott, American sociologist and anthropologist, has talked about. Or in natural resource management, it's this idea of maximum sustained yield, which has been critiqued for over 40 years, but people still use it all the time to try and think about how to do things, whether it's to get crops, get fish, get timber, all sorts of things, and now, even now thinking about carbon management. And the idea there is there's some kind of world where you can manipulate some kind of stock so you get a maximum sustained yield out of it. And this kind of thinking generally is assuming that the world is, is called linear, or that the consequences, the impacts of your actions are visible, that they occur immediately and dissipate over time, and they occur locally and dissipate over time. And we know the world isn't like that. We know that social ecological systems are complex, that history matters, that different places are different. The same thing doesn't work the same way in two different places. That, that external and local forces matter for specific places. That ecosystems change and evolve, you know, the sort of, like the evolution of resistance of for example. That people who live in ecosystems have different interests and they act accordingly to those interests. And also that people are reflexive, that they also act based on how they believe other people are going to act and how they think other things are going to happen in the future. And people change their beliefs and ideas and the organizations that use government over time. So if you think about all of this, what you can expect is that the world isn't so much something that you can get out this optimal stream of, of things, but it's more likely to be quite surprising and uncertainty, it, and uncertain. And it's also likely to be difficult to control. 
So if you're wanting to kind of tweak your fishery or your forest or your city to get this optimal benefit out of it, you should be skeptical both about being to able to estimate this optimal benefit, and secondly, that you're actually being able to control things to produce this benefit. Oh, and then, then finally, of course, that what is optimal is going to be different for different people. And so if you're wanting to have this as your goal, you might realize that other people have a different goal and it would be therefore difficult to achieve that goal. So that's maybe all true, but how much does it matter? Because things can be true, but not particularly useful. So if the world is more complex, where impacts can be bigger, distant in time and space, when is this going to be the case? This is going to be the case when there's pervasive connections and flows between things over time, when you have important uh, consequences of all these things. And so what, what is the evidence of this? I think this kind of maybe, if you think of what's going on today with the Euro, with the Arab Spring, it's maybe obvious that the world is not so predictable. But over on this side here, I'm supposed to stay here, I guess, uh, this is some examples of big ecological surprises from the 20th century. The rapid evolutions of pests and pathogens to biocides that attempted to control them was a big surprise. The biomagnification of toxins such as mercury up through the food chain was a big surprise. The emergence of disease by uh, agricultural irrigation, for example, was also a big surprise. And the simplification of ecosystems making them more unstable was also a surprise. So these were all things where people had schemes to improve humanity that ended up having significant uh, negative consequences, at least for some parts of humanity. And on, on the other side here, I have examples from my own country of Canada of the cod collapse, where after these record cod catches, you had this collapse of the fishery which never has returned after fishing has ceased. So it didn't bounce back as this sort of uh, maximum sustained yield theory would expect. And this is showing the food and oil prices over the last few years. So what I would argue is that when we think about sustainability, most of the tools we have are, are, have been developed to, to sit down in this quadrant, where we're assuming the world is controllable and understandable. And of course, some things in the world are controllable and understandable, but there's lots of stuff, and there's more and more of it all the time, that is difficult to control and difficult to understand. And resilience theory is aiming to kind of more fill in this arena up here, as are many other types of theories. So why particularly use resilience and to directly address uh, sustainability? If you kind of think of what I was just saying, that was more a theoretical version. And th this is a bunch of text from uh, Rob Hopkins, who's the kind of the guru of the transition towns movement, which if you're studying sustainability and you don't know about, it's probably interesting to find out about. It's probably the most rapidly growing and most successful movement. It started in the UK, now it's spread all over the world of various different groups of local people trying to improve their towns to be more sustainable. And their organizing theory is resilience. And why they do this, they, they pick it for a couple of reasons. One is that it's, they don't have to kind of figure out what they're trying to do. They have to, so they don't have to know what's gonna happen in the future. They can try and improve their ability to cope with shocks. Secondly, this is something that leaves it open for lots of different ways of defining what to do. So if some people want to try and build their community organization, some people want to build a local garden, all of those can fit within the rubric of, of building resilience, and it can enable people to come together to collaborate and do new things. And so this is something that I think is sort of showing the, the sort of the power of resilience approach for both kind of saying, well, we can deal with, gives us some capacity to deal with the unexpected rather than to plan for what we hope will happen, and it gives us space for a bunch of different people to work together. So, that's very quick. So what is resilience? Well, what is confusing, I think, is there are lots of different ways people use resilience. So I'm going to try and explain resilience through a little bit of a, a historical approach and give some examples. So this is a picture of uh, Buzz Holling, who's kind of the father of ecological resilience. And resilience comes from his work basically trying to un understand insect outbreaks and manage forests in eastern, eastern Canada. And, and he took tools of uh, predator-prey theory, systems analysis, and applied these to this insect outbreak situation and discovered stuff that didn't sort of match up with current thinking and developed this idea of resilience. 
And then this, this sort of basic idea from the early 1970s has diversified a lot, particularly since the 1990s. Now, there, there's sort of the original Hauling idea of resilience was that the world doesn't always just have this one bump. That there's not always sort of like the, if you want to talk about, say, the, the idea of one bump or this maximum sustained yield would be that the, some kind of invisible hand is always pushing you towards some state. Resilience is the idea, well, then maybe there's more than one. And if there's more than one, that means there's lots of interesting questions of what, what causes you to switch between these different ones. How does the existence or the possibility of these exist? And so this kind of initial thinking of what I've called up here persistence resilience was thinking about, well, in ecosystems, are there actually alternate configurations of ecosystems that can exist in the same place? And there's lots of debate about that that I'll come back to later, and then it's now people accept that that's true. Then from that, then people sort of got to think, well, what happens if a system reorganizes? What are the factors that control its ability to reorganize, that determine whether, say, if you have a forest that's eliminated, what are all those things from the diversity of the forest, its functions, its legacies, its connections to the outside world, that shape how that reorganization occurs? So this is sort of a new face of resilience that people have sort of worked it on from the 1990s, which is sort of focusing on this reorganizational resilience. So that's sort of the basic idea of resilience. But to give a more kind of complex idea, from this initial concept, which is very ecological, but in human-dominated ecosystems, in human management in the 70s, there's been this sort of diversification of concepts. So I've labeled here with theory to management and ecological to say more social ecological. And the colors here, I'm not going to go into detail, but are, are the time periods where these have developed. So the black is the 1970s, the lightest is in the 2010s. And what you can see is most, there's a whole big boom of stuff in, in the 2000s of new concepts. But what I'm going to do uh, after this is give some examples of these, and very quickly though, of some of these different concepts. But just to say there's a diversity of things, and a lot of these things are much less developed and are more vague. So, I think it's also useful to say, like, well, why, why do people do resilience and how do they do it? So this is like they're trying to do this in a nutshell. As I said with Hollings' original work, this came about in a transdisciplinary setting, meaning that it wasn't just between disciplines, but it was actually working with stakeholders or practitioners. So Holling was actually working with the Ministry of, Ministry of Forestry or something in New Brunswick and forest managers and, and people, various sort of interest groups and community trying to understand what was going on in this in an ecological context. But that's what transdisciplinary is. It's not just different academics talking about it, it's people who have some real problem in the real world, even if they're not quite sure exactly what that problem is. Resilience thinking has always had this kind of dynamic uh, tension or, or renewal between theory and practice. So people have moved from kind of working on really theoretical things to trying to apply them in practice and getting inspired with new theory from that. The, the sort of the pre-analytical beliefs, which I think are very important with talking with political ecology, because I think these are things that really differ between what people are interested in. And this is why something why I think you can have political ecology and resilience. Sometimes you want to ask totally different questions, and that's fine. Like, different questions should exist in the world. But you can use methods to answer the same questions, or, or you can use different method, the same methods to answer very different questions. So, Resilience is generally oriented around, so say, if you Google resilience, you'll see that there's lots of people who work on resilience with disasters, with psychology, with engineering materials, and these, these topics have developed in parallel, but have kind of cross-fertilization with resilience ideas. But for the kind of body of work, sort of ecological resilience and social ecological systems, people are primarily believe that that there is, uh, that people's livelihoods depend upon the biosphere, and that we're eroding the biosphere. And this is an important problem that people should pay attention to, and we want to spend our academic life working on. There were interests in the, dy the dynamic interactions between people and the organizations they create and their ideas with nature, but not interest in sort of the political ec economy of natural resources or, say, just carbon cycling inside a wetland, but this interaction between the two. And that we expect there will be surprise and the unexpected, and we want to develop tools to, to help deal with that. And really skepticism of universal answers to everything or general answers are going to work in all situations. 
Most of the research that people have done is based on in-depth case studies combined in, uh, with case comparison between these case studies. And so there's a variety of research results, some of which come out of theory, but they're usually drawing about from this case study comparison. So there's some places like the Everglades or Christianstad in Sweden or, or the Great Barrier Reef in Australia are some examples. So what I'm gonna briefly say is three ways sort of resilience thinking has kind of populated this matrix I put in. And with this sort of, when you can't control things, or if you can control things and you don't know what's going on, you can do experiments to learn about them. When you understand things and you can't control them, you can build insurance or you can build resilience to cope with what you don't, you don't control because you know what's going on. And if you don't control it and you don't understand it, you need to get creative to try and figure out ways in which you can understand it. So three of these ideas from resilience, one is regime shifts, one is adapt to management, and the other is the adaptive cycle. So regime shifts. This is just going to do very quickly. I saw uh, my PhD student Juan Rocha over there. When it works on regime shifts. If you're interested, you can talk to him. Uh, we have this database. And what's interesting with this, is this goes to the idea of, well, do these complex dynamics of nature actually matter? So if ecosystems can flip from one state to another, that's maybe academically interesting, but how com is it common or rare? If it's really rare, you can basically probably ignore it most of the time. But if it's really common, you need to deal with this. So the theory on regime shifts is try to understand, well, how common is this? The answer is maybe not everywhere, but there's quite a few cases which are pretty common. And why is this important? Is because what these regime shifts are is you have some shift in, say, an ecosystem or a human-dominated ecosystem or a social ecological system from producing one set of ecosystem services or benefits to people to another set. And a lot of these regime shifts, like say one that's the most well known, is uh, uh, lakes going from being clear water to murky, algae-rich water. Those are ones in which it's hard to find a group of people who like the algae-rich, polluted, toxic water, right? But other regime shifts, like a shift from a forest to a savanna, say in Central Africa, there, you have a shift in ecosystem services that benefits some people and not others. So there's a variety of these. And you can try and assess how human activities influence these regime shifts. So people can do things in a landscape that maybe shift ecosystems from states that they don't want to states that they do want, or shift from uh, try and avoid shifting to regimes they don't want. So this is an example from work uh, Lenny Gordon and Elena Bennett and I did on agriculture water-mediated regime shifts. And this is the kind of thing where, say, you have increase in agriculture production, but you cause hypoxia and kill off a fishery in the coastal area. It's important to understand that that can occur, and this kind of theory helps us understand how that occurs. So uh, adaptive management. Adaptive management is a practice of how to deal with unexpected turbulent ecosystems. And this is about kind of flipping management around to saying that policies aren't answers to problems, they're really questions about how the world works. And we should be planning as if, or acknowledging that we don't know how the world works, and have alter work on developing, well, what are the competing ideas about how the world works, and how can we test these over time? And then if we don't know these things, we need to have some capacity to cope with being surprised. And this, when I've taught about this in class, students go, well, this isn't all environmental management like this? And the answer is no. Most environmental management assumes that people know how the world works, and they do something that worked elsewhere, and they don't even bother checking to see if it worked. So what this involves, in a technical side, it involves trying to develop alternate models of how the world works and evaluating them, and then doing experiments, evaluating what you do as management to see if it works. And it's a social side, which is trying to develop uh, some kind of social learning so people can agree upon what they disagree about the world and have a shared understanding of how the maybe natural world works so they can more easily solve their division of resources issues. Because usually these things are all compounded together and it makes it hard to find solutions or people fight about things even though they agree about 80% of stuff. So I'm just going to try and wrap up here. So a big kind of theoretical overarching thing is this idea of the adaptive cycle. And this comes from, uh, sort of inductively, from a set of looking at a whole bunch of different case studies that often ecosystem management would be successful, but
but cause its own problems. As, as ecosystem management would simplify an ecosystem, people would invest in maintaining these benefits from an ecosystem, becoming more and more vulnerable to the collapse or the or disturbance in what they were getting from an ecosystem. And what, what this kind of shows is a general pattern of ecosystem management dynamics that we could kind of stylize to kind of think about, well, there's different times of things in social ecological systems where different types of policies are likely to work better. I'm not going to explain this in detail, but just kind of saying a process of policy implementation is often followed by uh, sort of this rigidity, and then you get these problems of what you're expecting to happen not happening, which leads to some reassessment or crisis, and a source for alternatives. And by trying to think about these things, using this to look, look at a system, you can kind of develop new ideas. And I think this is something particularly the Stockholm Research Resilience Center has been very good at. A lot of natural resource management is focused on this kind of forwards process of the sort of stabilization, efficiency, and, and management, but not looking at this process of reorganization and what happens to, to make it turn out good or bad. This is trying to do so. Those, I'm going to skip this. So then just say, resilience thing has been developed by a lot of people, some here in Sweden, but a lot of people from Canada, the UK, Australia, uh, that have combined with a whole bunch of, of different disciplines, from sort of initially more environmental things, but also connecting with economics, with management or organizational behavior. Most sort of famous person, Eleanor Ostrom, who a political scientist who won the Nobel Prize in economics, operationalizing things and connecting it to kind of climate change and development with, with uh, people from the UK. And I'm just going to wrap up now by just saying, where do some things connect? Well, uh, a, a student and I uh, are, are working on, on kind of thinking about uh, a paper trying to connect some political ecology ideas to resilience. And one of the things we thought was kind of interesting, we tried to apply this uh, Habermasian framework of knowledge to, uh, to uh, resilience ideas. And, oh no, let's see. Yes, sorry. So, so what you can kind of think about with this, uh, my slides are confusing. There, there's a lot of things that are focused on practice and theory. And this is the idea of kind of things that are looking at doing or analyzing things, uh, sort of understanding things, and then more uh, reflecting on things. And what you can kind of see here, there's actually a, a, a substantial gap here. And so this is, of course, something to critique, but this gives sort of a space where there's maybe some interesting room for kind of a, a critical uh, or, or some of this, or critical political ecology approaches to reflect on how the resilience approach is doing with, with this kind of thinking about what's going on, what are the structures that are embedded in. But also to recognize, this, this is so clear, that there's a bunch of these resilience ideas from this adaptive cycle, panarchy, adaptive government, transformation, that are, that are about change and transformation, that, that don't maybe explicitly, but implicitly deal with, with power, and especially deal with the reorganization of, of, say, social ecological systems or organizations and people, that potentially connect to a lot of things that people are interested with in political ecology. Uh, there, so. And this is to conclude, I think like political ecology and resilience, I actually did some little citation analysis. It's kind of interesting. They both kind of in, in papers, in ISI at least, kind of become, uh, rise up in interest pretty much in parallel with each other, from especially from the early 90s. Um, and there, there's, uh, there's substantial connections between them. They're, they're both from the resilience and the political ecology side. I think Carl Zimmer uh, is one of the political ecologists who's the most engaged with resilience stuff and has operationalized resilience ideas in his work. And there's been people like Neil Edger, Kate Brown, a little bit myself, but a lot of people also working with First Nations in Canada who combine resilience and sort of political ecology type approaches. There's new research programs like the UK's Ecosystem Services and Poverty Alleviation Program that explicitly ask people to kind of combine not a political ecology, but a political science and an ecosystem services or ecology approach, and they ask about resilience things too. And I, I already mentioned, I think First Nation things is maybe because in Canada, there's a lot of mandated co-management between Aboriginal peoples, First Nations in Canada, and, and the Canadian government. 
And there's a fair bit of people working with resilience, and a lot of aboriginal people are very interested in resilience and adaptive management approaches. So there's a lot of kind of ferment with that going on in Canada. Uh, the resilience researchers uh, have been long interested in the issues of power, and our kind of challenge, I think, to political science, political ecology tech colleagues would be like, how can we effectively address these things? Because I think that's been the problem of trying to integrate power ideas into our research effectively. Uh, and I think some of the barriers to this is that, from my perspective at least, the resilience is a little bit more managerial, but it's, it's more, a bit more focused on doing stuff, or trying to get stuff or analyzing what could happen in the future, while political ecology is a little bit about critiquing what has happened or is, has happened now. So it's a bit more backward looking. And I think one of the other barriers is, this is actually resilience, but, but uh, comparing political ecology to resilience, but you could also say political ecology to most uh, most science is that political ecology is largely done by single authored papers. I looked at this as well. And, and uh, other political ecologists have commented on, comment on this. So it's difficult to engage with political ecology ideas if political ecologists only work by themselves and don't engage in collaborations with other people. And there might be things to do with the political economy of status with, for political ecologists that does that. But that's a barrier to effective communication is most, just you can say, is Looking on ISI, the average number of authors for a political ecology paper was 1.1, and for a resilience paper, it was about three. So just showing that it's, there's a, a problem for spreading ideas, if that's the preference question. So I'll just finish that. Thank Thanks you. Very much. Thanks so much. Okay, so it's time for Al Kumbari, and. Uh, Alfis has a background in cultural anthropology and has a different uh, theoretical basis then. I think from a Marxist ontology, he is uh, theoretically based in political ecology, of course, as he will speak to up to date, ecological economics, environmental history, um, and other transdisciplinary theories. Um, Alf is, as I said, professor in human ecology now and head of department in London, the Human Ecology Division 2. And uh, also he has authored a lot of books, um, book chapters and cited uh, uh, yes, uh, papers in general. Um, yes, Alf, 20 minutes and you are very welcome to. Okay? Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you, Gary, for your presentation as well. I, uh, okay, let's see what we can do in 20 minutes. I will be sitting down. Um, um, I've been traveling all day since 7 o'clock in the morning. So. Uh, anyway, let's... Great. Oh. What's happening? Here? I write hate books about technology and they all spread back. Can you fix it? Okay, don't count this time now. No, <laughs> Okay, uh, political ecology, uh, I would argue, is a very transdisciplinary field, uh, as you can see by some of these major landmark books that have been published over the past uh, 30 years, uh, if you can see that. No? What's going on? Can you no. use that? Can you use that? Okay. Uh, here are some of the major books that uh, I should mention. I think. Uh, there's a very strong representation from geography, actually, and, and uh, Blakey and Brookfield uh, in 1987 published this book on land degradation and society, where, where political ecology was really established as a, as a perspective. I am an anthropologist originally, as, as Eva said, and that's why I like to quote Eric Wolf, because for me, as an anthropologist, Eric Wolf was the person who actually coined the expression political ecology back in 1972, which is exactly 40 years ago, actually. Um, but these, uh, this little selection of volumes shows how different uh, disciplines in social sciences and humanities have found use for the concept of political ecology. Not only geographers and anthropologists, but also political scientists, sociologists, philosophers, and so on. So this, um, I won't go through these, but these are some of the main, main uh, volumes that, that, that we have to think about as the canonical works on political ecology. Um, and to put it very simply, I would argue that political ecology is basically the political economy of the environment, 
And the uh, organizing question is how are social relations, including power structures, intertwined with ecological processes at local to global scales? Um, having worked on this problem over a number of decades, I have come up with an understanding of the complexities of communication, um, which I think we will be addressing here today. And I, I like to think of this particular um, context as a transdisciplinary dilemma, and it could be phrased this way. The people who tend to be most concerned about the global environment, and I think up to at least recently, uh, most of them were natural scientists, uh, are simultaneously the ones who, from my perspective, are the least equipped to understand how and why the global environment is threatened by human society, economics, and politics, simply because they have not studied human society, economics, and politics. Now, Gary is obviously an exception. He's got a PhD in sociology. We'll get back to that. Zoology. But, Zoology. Oh, I thought it was sociology. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyway, on the other hand, and I'm very conscious of this, coming, although I'm coming myself from social sciences, those who are better equipped to understand societal processes, the social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, and geographers, and so on, tend to be less concerned about the biophysical environment. At least this is what I found in anthropology. Over the, 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 all these decades of constructivism, you know, I mean, nature is in your mind. Nature has a social or cultural construction. So, uh, in a nutshell, then, the people who are best equipped to understand what is going on with the global environment seem to be the ones who care the least, and vice versa. And I think this is a major epistemological dilemma that I hope we can work towards um, you know, transcending today. So, what are these social ecological systems that Gary has been talking about? Uh, by the way, I would say socio-ecological. This is a small formal difference that I've discussed with Kelly Polk and so on. Um, I think that in, in trying to bridge these two disciplines or these fields, the social science and the natural sciences, we do have some recurrent problems uh, ha having to do with the kind of frameworks that we assume uh, coming from one or the other field. Uh, in, in the social sciences, um, Political ecology is a, is, a, is, a, is a predominant way of approaching human environmental relations. There is a strong focus on power, contradiction, conflicts of interest regarding distribution. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the cultural construction of nature, um, the flows of signs that pass through ecosystems, such as language and money. Uh, these are cultural flows that organize ecosystems. Uh, there's a tendency, unfortunately, to think of societies as not having environments, to think about politics without ecology, as some political ecologists have been criticized for doing. And there is also a focus on cultural perceptions constraining human thought, uh, discourse analysis, and things like that. Now, on the other hand, we have the natural sciences, uh, where I think the systems ecology approach is definitely predominant, resilience uh, approach. And um, over the past few years, we have seen the resilience approach becoming more and more dominant in terms of public discourse, and also, I would argue, in terms of research funding, if I may bring up such a practical matter, because there's quite a lot of money that actually goes into resilience research. And this, of course, uh, considering that there's a kind of a competition over research funding all the time, means that we have, we have a field that has been extremely successful in terms of publications and so on, but has uh, sort of taken over more and more of the public discussion and debate and research on human environment relations, which I think is a bit unfortunate. I'd like to see a bit more diversity there. Um, these systems ecology approaches stress what I would call function and adaptation rather than power and contradiction. Uh, rather than stressing conflict, there's an emphasis on consensus regarding the necessity of sustainability and survival. Uh, there is a concern about an objective biosphere, which I certainly uh, uh, applaud. Uh, rather than looking at flows of cultural signs, such as language and money, there's a 
a, a, a primary emphasis on flows of matter and energy. And of course, this is only natural thinking about ecosystem ecology as the, as the place of coming from. Uh, on the other hand, from my perspective, I sometimes think that we're dealing with ecosystems without humans and ecology without politics. So there's a kind of a mirror image problem here. Politics without ecology or ecology without politics. And hopefully we can work towards integrating these two frameworks. And rather than thinking in terms of how cultural perceptions constrain thought, uh, there's a concern with how natural limits constrain growth. So there are all kinds of uh, interesting contrasts between these two approaches. And they, they show up very clearly for me when I read the resilience literature, and probably they show up for you when you read the political ecology literature too. Well, we'll talk about that later. You said there's not much of a conflict. Well, what are systems? Systems is an interesting concept in itself. And of course, systems, system is a word that's been used both in social science and natural science. Um, and I believe that we really need to clarify the differences between um, social and ecological systems because they are different. And um, I think Gary will agree with me about this. And there's even a chapter in Panarchy that talks all about the difference between social and ecological systems. Um, this is a, a volume, a conference volume that Carol Cromley at the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, and I uh, published a few years back called The World System and the Earth System. And one of the ideas with this volume was to uh, demonstrate the differences in approaches between the social sciences and the natural sciences in terms of looking at the planet or, or global scale uh, connectedness as, as systems. There's a difference in the world, between the world system approach and the earth system approach. Last week, by the way, there was an earth system governance conference in Lund, which which uh, confirmed all my notions about what Earth system discussion uh, tends to be in relation to world system governance. World system, sorry, world system analysis. Well, uh, I use these somewhat dated images just to give you an idea of at least my image of where ecosystems analysis comes from, looking at ecosystems as complex adaptive machines that have their logic, their functioning, and their adaptive cycles. We'll get back to the adaptive cycle later. But we really need to discuss the epistemology of systems. I think this is fundamental to, to, to what we can discuss here today. And I would pose questions such as, are there really general regularities, such as cycles, in all systems, social systems and ecosystems? Doesn't matter, they're all systems, apparently, and they share some kind of general regularities. Now that's one issue I'd like to discuss. Are all systems really geared to adaptation and survival? We heard Gary mention the adaptive cycle as being fundamental not only to forest biomass and ecosystems, but also to social and economic structures. And I worry about that. I really do not think about what happens in the world of finance and social relations in terms of adaptive cycles. Uh, maybe you can convince me. We'll talk about it. But we'll, 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 get, we'll get back to that. I'm not sure it's a question of adaptation when, when Wall Street collapses. Okay, so the question is, can social systems learn? Can social systems learn? This seems to be a, a basic assumption of a lot of this theorizing, and I am of the opinion of my old teacher, Jonathan Friedman, who dealt with these issues back in the 1970s, that societies are not learning systems. They do not learn in the way that organisms do. Now, when I mention Jonathan Friedman, it's because I really need to say that this is something that anthropology discussed very intensely in the 1960s and dealt with. Because a lot of people then were, were talking about cultural ecology. And for me, at least, what is being said now through the resilience uh, approach is extremely similar to what was said in the 1960s by the cultural ecologists. It's all about adaptation, its function, its cycles, and so on. And, and learning, learning. And uh, in anthropology, we dealt with this in the 60s and 70s and uh, moved over to political ecology. That's why it's so strange for me to find myself back in these, these old discussions. Um, what about the role of power and contradiction in social systems? We heard that this is a strong, uh, there's a strong interest in this 
and the resilience camp, and frankly, I haven't seen too much of it. Uh, what about cultural idiosyncrasies, fetishism, ideology, exploitation, and collapse? Not only like a forest biomass can collapse in a forest fire, but the kind of collapse that we saw in the Roman Empire. Uh, how is that to be studied with ecosystem cybernetics? I am hesitant. I am skeptical. So the question is, why do systems mean different things to different sciences? And here again, I want to uh, remind you of the experience of anthropology. Several decades back, we moved as a discipline from cultural ecology to political ecology because we found that cultural ecology was too concerned with the local. We needed to look at the global flows of not only energy, but also money, language. We needed to move from adaptation to contradiction. We needed to move from consensus to conflict, from resource management, which sounds so nice, we all want to manage our resources, to talk about capitalism, to talk about why capitalism as a system tends to generate unsustainable resource management systems. And we move from equilibrium ideas of socio-ecological systems to, to uh, collapse uh, scenarios, which I suppose at the face of it do not uh, contradict the Holling uh, adaptive cycle because there's also a, a collapse element in that, but there are different ways of approaching collapse and we'll get back to that in the discussion. Um, Gary said something about how, how political ecologists tend to be long wolves. Well, it's true that we do very often publish single authored pieces, but I just want to show you the most recent uh, work uh, I've been involved in. It's a Rutledge volume called Ecology and Power. There are 23 chapters in it, and there are chapters representing all kinds of disciplines like geography, anthropology, sociology, economic history, archaeology, development studies. So I don't really think we're lone wolves. We are, uh, actually this book comes out of a research project and a conference devoted precisely to issues of political ecology, and uh, whether yes, and whether resilience is as fertile a an approach as political ecology. Um, this was, you know, sh what's it called? Shameful self-promotion. <clears throat> it's an expensive book. Don't buy it. Uh, I have the proofs in a PDF version. You know. Anyway, in, <laughs> in in this book, there's an interesting chapter that I would recommend Gary and your colleagues. It's by Michael Sheridan, the anthropologist. Uh, it's very empirical. It focuses on a case study, uh, groups in Tanzania, and their water management. And what the purpose of this whole chapter is, is to contrast the usefulness of resilience theory versus political ecology. And uh, as you may expect from it being in this book, uh, the conclusion is quite clear that uh, political ecology is the only way to explain what has been happening over the past few decades or even centuries in this society in Tanzania, whereas the resilience model simply does not work to understand the empirical evidence. So, I mean, uh, it's not that it's all high theory. There are attempts to test these models, and uh, I really, um, you know, recommend this particular case study. The question is whether uh, we're looking in here at societies viewed through the lens of natural science. I believe personally, and it's quite natural that that should be the case, that systems ecologists have not found it necessary to deal theoretically with power and unequal distribution, culture and communicative flows, the fact of recurrent societal collapse in world system history understood through other than ecosystem cybernetic theories, uh, and the observation that unsustainable practices are largely inherent in capitalism. Now this, to me, is the socio-ecological system we should be looking at. Here you see the top map, the world map of where the money is, uh, the density of B GDP. Uh, the bottom map is, although difficult to see, it's a satellite image of nighttime light. So basically you can see that, well this is actually capital accumulation viewed from outer space. Uh, the top map shows where the money is, the bottom map shows where the machines are, and the maps are identical. Now these are the global systems that I think we should look at. And I'd be really interested in knowing how a resilience approach could help us understand these distributions 
these distribution patterns when it comes to capital, money, technology. Um, I'll try to speed up here. Yes. Uh, this is a physical trade balance of Colombia that shows how a country like Colombia in the periphery of the world system since the mid-80s has been continuing to export more, much more of its physical resources than it has imported. Uh, and it's part of something that I call ecologically unequal exchange. I would argue that power by its very nature is both material and symbolic. It always entails unequal access to material resources, which is something that could be measured and studied by natural science, but it also always implies a cultural mystification of such inequalities. So, in a way, power is always a hybrid between the material and the cultural. Uh, and uh, we have seen a lot of examples of different kinds of uh, ecological problems uh, that are due to positions in the world system. Here are some examples of impoverishment and overload, and I hope I don't have too many slides left. This is the last one. Yes. So what my conclusion is this. Processes of anthropogenic environmental change are political. They're always political. Power inequalities are fundamental to processes of anthropogenic environmental change in the past and in the present. Such processes derive from ecologically unequal exchange, for example, net flows of quantifiable resources such as food, energy materials, embodied labor, embodied land, and other modes of environmental load displacement, such as seeing to it that the pollution doesn't wind up where we are, but somewhere else, externalizing pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now stop the discussion. I think it can be as so I need to sit closer to you. We will now sit, stop the discussion <laughs> uh, with uh, Gary, who has now the chance to comment on us speak. And that one is off, right? Yes, much better. Hmm? Okay. Uh, a few minutes, Gary, and because I don't want, I know that these two gentlemen can discuss with each other for the whole afternoon and the whole evening, but that is not the only the point here. We also want to let the audience discuss with you. So please. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, can, I, can I get the PowerPoint? Sorry. Um, oh, you want to go back? To yeah, yeah, I wanted to address a couple of things. Which one? Oh, no, no my, my PowerPoint. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I guess I would like to start with, um, I, I uh, sort, of, sort of have agreements and disagreements. And what, what I agree, and I think it is uh, Fine, it's, a, it's our Alf's closing slide about that uh, political structures and inequalities are essential to shaping what has and hasn't happened in the, in the world. And I think that's something that's, that, I mean, if you pay any attention to history or to say the world, it should be obvious. And there's obvious problems when you do things like, say, uh, development economists often do things like do regressions, where they treat in every individual country as being unique and independent of one another. When obviously what has happened in, say, the Congo isn't independent of, say, European powers in the United States, you know, where you had you know, incredibly brutal invasion and, and exploitation and then, you know, uh, intervention. So I think that's a really important thing to look at. And, and I think there's lots of interesting things to do with that. But then I think that there's a, a few things where I hope they can just sort of clarify things, uh, where, where I think there's some sort of, uh, misunderstanding, uh, at least from my, my view of how people think about resilience. So it's going to start just with the, the adaptive cycle here. So, so th this isn't meant to be some kind of prescriptive thing about how the world works or how things do work. What, what it is is that basically looking at a whole bunch of case studies, there seems to be some general type of pattern, and this seemed to fit with a bunch of cases. So it's interesting to look at things and think about these periods of sort of, of focusing on efficiency, and then the, the crises that can come from that, and the reorganization. And does that occur or not? And say, within the resilience community, I know like, people have talked about things like, say, agriculture in Zimbabwe, where it doesn't fit the cycle. And there's a number of papers by people, I know like Graham Cumming and others, that are explicitly about how interesting things have, that don't fit this, this cycle. In the book, Panarchy, this kind of big book for the, the, of, of the resilience community, there's a whole bunch of stuff talking about rigidity and poverty tracks 
proposing ways that this cycle can be de derailed. And these are sort of hypotheses, just to point out this, this isn't a prescriptive way of thinking about the world. And I think that stepping back, I feel that Alpha is kind of blurring together this sort of 1970s systems ecology of what we do at the Resilience Center now in 2012. Well, I have a background in ecology, but I also have a background in engineering and technology, and I work with political scientists, and I was a professor in geography department before I moved to, to, to Sweden. So I, I don't feel I'm some kind of systems ecologist. And at the center, we have people who are political scientists and, all, and, and from a whole bunch of different backgrounds, including anthropology. And what people are interested in is, is trying to think about this idea of resilience in different systems. And that's different, very, very different from trying to explain why something has happened. We're interested in how things respond to shocks and surprise and reorganization. Not to say, like, why did something happen in the past? Obviously, these, these things are related. And, and I think that's, that's what I was trying to say earlier about this idea of trying, of maybe working a bit from a transdisciplinary perspective. Because at least maybe we have some miscommunication here, but uh, to me, there's interdisciplinary means working across disciplines. Transdisciplinary means working with stakeholders. And I don't believe that your books are doing that. So maybe it's, if they are, it's so good to clarify that. So when you're working with stakeholders, where does the research question come from? So say, I worked on fire management in Florida. That was with people who were concerned with conserving longleaf pine forests there. And that was the research question. Through this process of sort of learning and adaptive management, we sort of shifted the research model. We, we collaboratively built a model. And there turned out to be some resilience issues with that, that by taking into account resilience, you could actually much more effectively manage the for for forest, because people were ignoring the fact that the forest could be in these alternate states and acting as if it was only in one, and therefore they were, they were basically wasting a lot of effort, and they could do stuff much more cleverly, and then people did that. So that was sort of a successful thing in the real world. Uh, or another case is, say, one of my students has been working a lot, or former students, now a professor in, in Quebec, working a lot with a, a First Nation, a Aboriginal people in Quebec, to try to develop an adaptive treaty. So it's trying to apply some of these resilience ideas to this treaty-making process to basically empower these local people with, in their in negotiations with the Canadian government, to find something that, that met their needs and could cope with the surprises they would know that they knew that they were going to face, but the government wanted them to commit to one thing for all time, right? So I think that's a bit more how resilience is, and I think this is really at the end. Alf's question is a really different one than what resilience researchers are interested in, in general. I mean, people, but, but, or say, are working on. But we're interested in that question too, right? It, it, we're not saying that our question is better than that question. Uh, but we have this sort of uh, focus on trying to understand resilience and robustness in a whole bunch of different contexts. And, and one of them, briefly up there, is a sort of idea of adaptive governance, which is not about, I would say, like trying to make the world a fair place, even though maybe personally we would like it to be. It's about how to have robust governance of complex systems in this turbulent century that we're in. And you could use that research to have really bad, robust governance that's bad and mean for people, or really good. And that's, that's sort of, uh, I would say, not resilience researchers, but resilience is a bit of a, a neutral concept that way, which I think is different from political ecology. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, do you have, have any comments on that now? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a very short one, actually. Then I'd like to get back to the questions regarding uh, Gary's own work on, on comparing political ecology and, and ecological resilience, because Gary has written an article on that that I want to yes. talk about mm -hmm. specifically. But, um, uh, what, I'm, what surprises me is that Gary says now that I'm asking different questions than the resilience people are because I thought I just heard him say like half an hour ago that power is an extremely important question for resilience uh, approach and actually all I'm talking about is power. So in which way are our questions different? Are you interested or not interested in power would be my, my, my return question. Okay, I, I, I think, uh, so I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. But I think mo most of the resilience, I think you agree with this too, that most of the resilience research are not studying issues of power. And, and, but, but there's lots of questions in the world, right? Uh, so I think, uh, maybe another way of saying it, I think quite a few resilience researchers, and I think uh, several in this room, are working on power issues in their PhD research. 
and that resilience research would like to work more on that in the future. But we don't have some big track record for that. So I think I think we agree on that. It's maybe just I'm not being clear. Okay. Um, well, uh, actually, I've been looking at quite a lot of the resilience literature. I've been reading Panner P, which is a book that you just mentioned, and your own article here on uh, political ecology and ecological resilience. And I've been reading very carefully, and I don't find very much about power that really speaks to me as a social scientist, as a political ecologist. So I think. Uh, Please let me finish. I, 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 I don't think that um, we have any, we're not served by trying to straddle the issue. I think we would be analytically much clearer if we actually could agree on the fact that we do have different approaches and different assumptions and talk about how those different frameworks could actually build something together. That's where I would like to wind up. But let's not begin by saying that there's no difference between political ecology and resilience theory because there is to me a huge difference. And let me uh, talk about this. In your article here, Ecological Economics 10 years ago, you have one sentence that I really agree with, and that's the one I quoted here. Uh, Ecologists need to better understand the behavior of humans. Now this is written, I suppose, by a zoologist. I thought it was a sociologist. OK, anyway. Um, so, so I think this is, this is very true. Ecologists need to better understand uh, the behavior of humans. And in fact, I think your article illustrates that. Now, let's get back to the adaptive cycle. You said uh, to me in the intermission that Buzz Hauling is not a systems ecologist, but I don't agree. I remember his work in the 70s, uh, Buzz Hauling or Crawford Hauling, certainly a systems ecologist. And the interesting thing is that his model, this lying down eight, the adaptive cycle, is the model for just about everything. I mean, it's on the cover of panel. It's, it, it's the model for all resilience work. And so it really calls for looking very closely at this model. Now, if this adaptive cycle is applicable not only to ecosystems like the forest biomass that Crawford Holling studied in the 70s, uh, but also to societies, then we, we, you really need to explain to social scientists what's so good about this for social science. Uh, and uh, I would like to begin by asking a few questions about this general model. In, 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 if it is so important to the resilience theory, then we really need to understand it as political ecologists and social scientists. Uh, there's a growth uh, phase, right? The R phase, the bottom left-hand corner, the growth phase. And I would like to begin by asking, what exactly is it that grows and is being conserved? I mean, your, your parameter to the left-hand side of the diagram says capital. Now, is capital? What is growing, and are we then talking metaphorically about forest biomass as capital, or about money as capital, or are both kinds of capital subsumed within this model? Could you respond to that to begin with? Yeah, I think the, the short answer is that, that that axis has always been uh, problematic for the resilience community. And if you look through resilience articles, you'll see many, many different versions of it. And uh, other people like Brian Walker and others uh, don't think it's so useful to do it as a lazy eight, and to more think about that how I, I drew it as well. It's more this this conflict between sort of simplification, efficiency orientation, which leads to a vulnerability to crisis, and that, those are useful things to look at. And I, I think also too, it's maybe not so useful to think about as a model as I was trying to say. This is more I think the way people have used it and is to kind of interpret things and particularly to be inspired about hypotheses, right? Uh, that I think one of the things that people have done is to try and say, well, they're early on, I think this is really true, say, of the 80s in ecology, there's a huge focus on the sort of succession of this sort of going up, but very little effect on, of, of what happens with crisis or reorganization. And, and there's still, there's been much more attention to this kind of crisis disturbance and all this but still very little understanding of these processes of reorganization. I think that's what a lot of people actually are interested in, actually understanding what goes on during those times, inspired by this model, to say, well, this is interesting things to look at, rather than to uh, try and fit the world into it. OK, but you're not too happy about this model, then. You didn't like the axis, the capital axis. But it's out of your own article. Yeah. So, so if you remember what I said, Okay. So I said that it's evolved over time. Okay. Yeah, so we didn't get one answer. Okay. So it's really right. What you, read, what, you, what you write wrote 10 years ago, that's what you're saying. So, 
because it, it does raise some questions. Let me let me show how. Let me show how. This is so, so I think I think you can trust what I wrote ten years ago, but I think that's a very this is a normal unpolite way of talking to me. But this is uh, here, wait. Uh, yeah. uh, this is uh, wait, wait. Okay. Could you please uh, have your whole argument? Because now yes, you're yes, yes. Okay. it gets a little bit mean because you're testing one step sure, at a time. Sure. If you have your whole argument out, I would. And yes, then I'm Gary. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gary, if I offended you. I didn't mean to do that. Because I wanted to know, I mean, have I been wasting my I hope not. Uh, here is another diagram from your, from your article where you show how Holling's line down 8 can be applied to different kinds of SES, social ecological system. And the interesting thing is if you really look very closely at these diagrams, you will see that the R phase, the growth phase, is applicable not only to the growth of forest biomass, as in Holling's own models, uh, but also to the growth of the logging industry. And so that worries me a bit. How can you have a socio-ecological system where the implications are completely opposite for the two parts of the system? Uh, if the forest spider mass increases as a, as a growth, as an example of the growth uh, phase of an adaptive cycle, but also the logging industry, the same thing applies to fish stocks and fisheries. The article is on salmon. And I'm wondering whether wouldn't you see a, a sort of a negative correlation between them so that when, when, the, when the fisheries increase, the capital stock in fisheries increase, the, the salmon population goes down? W would you, could you really say that, this is a, that they're connected? Could you explain that to me? Yeah, I could. Um, so, uh, actually, you've got, do you have the actual paper there? Yes, um, I have the paper. If I can just maybe put it up. So, or I can just say that there's another figure in that paper that's, that's talking about that the, these systems operate at a variety of scales. There's different things going on at different scales. And this figure there was an attempt to connect. And I would also say, like, to say, like, let's see if I can put these two ideas together. And that's how it's framed in the paper. It's not framed as, like, this is the ultimate answer for all time. So that's why I get a bit irritated with your way of questioning me. Uh, and, and so what it is saying is, is let's apply these different kind of... Uh, ways of connecting people and nature together, which have gone through posts. The people said, let's build a dam. Let's build dams. Let's operate these dams. Then these dams start to get old. What are we going to do with these dams? So I think that is something where I then tried to apply this adaptive cycle to, to this. And what, what the adaptive cycle or the panarchy idea here is, it's interesting to think about in your kind of overall system where things are operating at different scales, how do these kind of different phases interact with one another? So my point here, which is kind of interesting, it was more connecting to these ideas of power about how something like the idea of dam removal went from this idea that was just like insane, that no one even could like think about it, to something kind of crazy environmentalists would talk about, but gets like sort of shouted down with being crazy, to then it's something that now people can move dams in this area. And so it, it's more thinking about, in that sense, how, how do these different kind of reorganizations of things work together or, or impact one another to affect the whole system. And this is kind of the idea too, it's like what, what alternatives could come out of something, you're more likely to get maybe a bigger, more substantial, more large scale change if a bunch of these sort of cycles are all kind of at a vulnerable point together because then you can have sort of systemic change across the whole system. While if you have a bunch of these things that are really working really great, it's unlikely that your change is gonna affect these things because they're working so great. So for in this case, right, so if you're at a point where there's crisis in salmon and problems with the dams, then those pro things are likely to connect together. But if, if you have crisis in the salmon and no problems with the dams, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to influence the dams. So that's the way of kind of metaphorically using this. And I think in this too, I, I think what's also like, you could kind of say that, well, I use power wrong. But I, I use a definition that's widely used in the social science, and maybe you don't like this. a social science definition of, of this like over, over power and everything, Luke's different, different dimensions of power that is very widely used. And so I think it's unfair also to say that I'm doing a natural science thing when I'm actually just doing stuff of a different aspect of social science than what you're doing, right? So I think that's something to be fair with talking about social versus natural science as well. Um, I, I don't think uh, just a moment. One of my questions. I have one for you, Gary, and one for you, Alf, and then maybe I will put the, some other questions depending on what the audience say later. But one of them I think fits very well now, so I will take it, the one that I have for you. 
if you think about what real benefits or what's qualitatively new uh, by applying resilience theory on social systems, what would your key things, key answer would be to that? Uh, what is new? What, why does resilience theory, why, why should it be used on social systems? Because I also, as a researcher, have come out of a, well, almost, have almost come out of a trans interdisciplinary, your definition, project, um, where we have a ver very hard time to agree, like a, a little bit like you do now, uh, but it has been a question. Uh, what kind of theory can you apply um, from natural science and from social science on these interrelationships and, well, what is qualitatively new with applying resilience on social systems? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm not totally sure how to answer this because I think we, we've largely tried to work on these sort of social ecological systems yes. and not things just strictly... Uh, to uh, widen it to... Yeah, but, but, I, but I think just to jump a little bit in, Tell me if this is totally a bad answer. Uh, but, but just jump, is one of the things I think is very interesting is the financial crisis. It, is the financial crisis actually, there's many causes, there's multiple causation for the financial crisis, but some of the things very much fit with, with resilience theory. And, and especially in this kind of adaptive cycle, and actually what's very interesting is it's very, very similar to some old economics theory, but cast in a different light mm -hmm. of the sort of Minskyan uh, uh, economics. Mm -hmm. But for some economic economists, they find the resilience ideas interesting because it's been developed in a different way and it says some things about, well, what are some of the factors that are contributing to resilience or not? And how you can think about, I think one of the things is thinking about diversity, which I didn't really talk about. But in ecology, right, people have done quite a lot of, of ways of thinking about different aspects of diversity. Mm -hmm. So say, like, thinking about not just the number of species, but how your diversity of functions, the diversity of responses. So I think one thing that could be very interesting that <coughs> we've contributed is this idea of response diversity. And that's this idea of that you could have, say, a number of entities, and if they're all vulnerable to the same shock, you have no diversity yet. And I think this is kind of these issues with the financial crisis of you have all these different people, but they're all believing exactly the same thing, getting all their information from the same sources, and so you don't really have diversity there. Mm -hmm. And so let's say you've got like three rating agencies or something, it's not real diversity because they're using the same models, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's fair, that's metaphorical, but I think another way of maybe saying something is like just not giving a long answer, but what, what, what I was saying before about mismanaging fire in Florida, they're like basically uh, help save this endangered ecosystem that's down to 1% of its range that wasn't going to be able to sustainably change by being working with the system rather than against it. And that's in a social ecological system, a, a completely cultural landscape where to maintain this historic ecosystem, you have to intervene, and if not intervening, it's going to go extinct. So it's sort of how to better fit people in nature together. I think that's a very good example that had real benefits because people really wanted to maintain that, but despite wanting to maintain it, they weren't able to do it because they didn't have any kind of practical theory to do it and resilience to give them some ways of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Because, and then I take the question to you also. <coughs> because I know that what you talked about, the world system, the earth system, and uh, you had many arguments for why resilience theory could not, should not be uh, applied on social systems. But um, what then, and I understand, I think you say that, that there's, there needs to be different analysis for ecological systems and for social systems. And you've also talked a little bit about that, but also your key argument for that, please. Yeah, okay, well that connects right, right to, the, to the next question I asked Gary, so I'll try to uh, respond to both those those concerns, um, because uh, I, I think there's an asymmetry here. It's not just actually that natural scientists and social scientists are doing the same thing. Uh, and if I may express myself a bit nastily, I would say colonizing the other field. Uh, because I'm, I'd like to try to think uh, what it would look like if a bunch of political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists would, would, would begin to describe ecosystems, 
uh, from their perspective and say that ecosystems are really power structures and they would hardly refer to all the natural science literature and ecosystems. But actually this is what I find that uh, a lot of natural scientists are doing, not just the resilience people, but here you're talking about society, social systems, and using a model which is, is quite clearly based on, on, on natural science, e ecosystem. You're, in a sense, you're colonized, you're saying that social, social phenomena can be subsumed within the theoretical framework and developed by natural science. <coughs> this is what offends social scientists, I think, because it's not, it's not symmetric. I don't do that. I respect the work of natural scientists tremendously. And I think most political ecologists, they think of ecosystem functioning as quite clearly a, a fact, you know, and we leave that to the natural scientists, but it doesn't seem that you're willing to do the same with the social science aspect. Now, let, let, if, you look, if you turn around, Gary, and look at this, these are also quotes from your article. Uh, I agree completely that we have to see to the way that social and ecological systems interact the fact that we have what you call SES, coupled social ecological systems. But there's something else in your argument than just showing that. You're actually drawing analogies. You talked about metaphors between social and ecological phenomena, and that's where I have problems. And all these quotes are from your article. Uh, the four phases of the adaptive cycle, and you give examples from ecosystems and from society. And I really bounce at this, because here you're talking, for example, about financial panics, like you just did, as part of an adaptive cycle, as comparable to forest fires or insect outbreaks. And I'm wondering, why do we need economic science? You know, I, I mean, if, if you can explain this in similar terms as ecosystem functioning, then I'm wondering why we have all these enormous amounts of people trying to study financial breakdowns, you know, if we can understand it in terms of these models. Uh, Outsiders take over an organization. That's an example of, that's of the reorganization phase, similar to the invasion of exotic species. To me, these are very facile understandings of very complex social phenomena dressed in a systems theoretical vocabulary. Or, or, and uh, it bothers me as a scientist. I think it's, I mean, you haven't studied these things, <laughs> obviously. You haven't studied financial panics. How can you talk about financial panics in terms of zoology? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm glad that some people here respect display boundaries, uh, but I, I guess I don't so much. And uh, I, I, I think there are, of course, dangers of using metaphorical speech, but I, I think it's also a bit unfair that I wasn't trying to explain organizations. I was trying to explain my ideas by using a few different metaphors there. And, I, uh, and I, I'm a bit puzzled because I, I, I kind of Things say I, I'm a bit of a quantitative scientist, so I, I didn't realize that there's a, a, a different way of doing time series analysis in anthropology versus there is in in uh, finance versus there is in uh, I don't know geophysics. There's different characteristics of your data and different types of questions you're going to ask. But if you're using differential equations. You can model lots of different things with differential equations. You can mo model lots of different things with an ANOVA or something. And I, I think really, like, you know, there, there's been a lot of research, too, about the creation of sustainability science. So I, I self-identify as a sustainability scientist. And uh, I think that's largely what the kind of students we're trying to train at our center. We're not trying to reproduce human ecology or political science or something. We're trying to create a new discipline that draws upon other things. And I think it's unfair to say that we are trying to colonize social sciences because we're trying to understand social ecological systems in which human intentions and human beliefs are an important part of ecological dynamics. <coughs> and if we just stopped to the ecological dynamics, we wouldn't understand what's going on in the ecosystem. And we'd like to be told we're doing it wrong, but it'd be nice to know like how we could do it right rather than to be told to stop doing it. And uh, I basically completely disagree with your ideas about colonization and everything. And it's, I think that's a really horrible metaphor if you talk about metaphors. I, I, I haven't gone around to think of chopping off anyone's hands recently. So, uh, thanks. The thing has to be right how, how good you do something, not that they cannot do it. Um, I think if they respect uh, well, yes, historical I, knowledge. I, mean, I just think it's, it would be very reasonable if, if, the, if there is an ambition in, in, in the Stockholm Resilience Center, for example, to understand power, as you started out by saying, to really seriously engage 
with all the century of social theory on power and to try to you know assimilate that in some sense. I think that would be important. Could I ask you something else from your from your article? Um, the last thing, maybe we will take your oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I just wanna I'm a bit puzzled by by your by your diagram. I you know, this is a diagram again from your article, and there are all kinds of arrows all, all over the place. And just for clarification, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand the logic. What do the arrows mean? Uh, some arrows mean uh, levels of inclusiveness. Some mean antagonism. Some mean um, uh, causation. Uh, obviously, uh, salmon are not a larger group than regulators. I, I, I don't understand what the arrows mean. Is there a mix-up here, or am I confused? Uh, uh, well, it's probably my or a diagram, uh, but it's, it's basically meant to represent, let's say, in a salmon fishery, so it's not salmon, salmon fishery, you have different groups. And, and if, you, if you talk about these things, it's quite different depending on what the scale is you're talking about. And it's interesting to think about, say, if you talk about fishers, that, that you have commercial and sport fishery, and this fishery and sport fishermen are very important. And in the commercial, you have, say, tribal and non-tribal, and there are different rules and different things that apply to these. That's, that's all that that's saying. It's basically, I always thought this is maybe a bad diagram for a political ecologist, but it's trying to deal with something that's actually rel relatively important to political ecology of understanding heterogeneity in, in systems. Uh, yeah, just trying to understand the diagram. I don't understand. Okay. All right. That was the last question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. I think it's time for you to put some questions to our speakers. And uh, Hayden and Dosh will walk around with the microphone. So. And I will try to keep the order, and that would be really hard as I don't know if all of you, so I cannot think of you by name. I have to do something else. Okay? Yeah. I have more questions, and I'm sure you could put questions to each other also if it's quiet, but I wouldn't expect it to be. So please, raise your hand if you want to ask something. Yes, up in the corner, and maybe I... Yes, you too. Nurse, will you walk yeah, all the way I'm up? Just trying please. to make it work. So, who wants to take it? And please, thank you. If you want to, you can say. Yeah. Um, my name is Stephen Wojnieski, and I'm studying the Masters in the Stockholm Museum Centre. And my question is basically, we've talked a lot about resilience, but we haven't talked much about political ecology. And political ecology is called political ecology, but there's very little ecology within that field. So I wonder whether you could comment on that. Okay. Uh, well, like I said before, I guess that was a question that's from you, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Like I said before, the book that I showed the cover of, Ecology and Power, uh, where we in the introduction are actually proclaimed that we're, we think we're doing political ecology, uh, respects that the study of what actually happens in ecosystems is not something that sociologists or anthropologists can really cover. You know, we really respect that that's ter territory for natural science, but then we try to show how social processes and power structures actually uh, are intertwined with whatever we learn from the natural sciences is going on in the ecosystems. So all those 23 chapters are actually case studies of ecosystems, but we leave it to the natural sciences to study the ecological dimension. We don't have that pretension, but we do want to put humans into the ecosystems and using social theory to explain the role of humans in, in, in transforming those ecosystems, okay? Yes. Can, or, can, can, can I, I respond? Because I, I think just actually that their political ecology is very diverse, and so there are political ecologists who actually do do more ecology. I think, let's say, Paul Robbins is, is someone like that, and Carl Zimmer is one like that. And just my little advertisement, uh, I have a Mendeley group. So if you Google resilience and political ecology, that's a bunch of papers that are combining resilience and political ecology. And I think Carl Zimmer, who's a famous American geographer, he's been doing a lot of stuff combining, trying to combine resilience and political ecology in, in Andean agriculture. Uh, so I think there, there are a lot of models for that. And political ecology is very, very diverse. So there's there's a pretty famous paper called uh, Political Ecology, Where is the Ecology by a Political Ecologist. Yeah. Hi, I'm a postdoc at 
the Resilience Center. Um, I must say I'm a little bit um, disappointed with the way the seminar has kind of turned because I, I, in the beginning I was feeling quite optimistic about a nice kind of dialogue between political ecology and resilience and that kind of tipped towards a sort of epistemological clash between the two, which is something that I've seen also in papers that I've written about that sort of subject uh, recently. And um, it seems to me that there is something inherent about this particular debate that doesn't allow it to move forward. And there's some sort of epistemological issue that we, we would have to resolve if we were to kind of bring these issues sort of closer together. And I'm kind of thinking, so a kind of open question that seems that hasn't really been clarified up to now is, is this possible? And kind of your, your own honest sort of personal opinion about that, and if so, how? And I'm kind of thinking about work that's been done recently that perhaps uh, Alf, you might want to look at that perhaps shows that because the sort of snapshot of resilience that you've portrayed, I think, was taking us back a few years. And now there's a different, perhaps, breed of resilience thinkers that are trying really to bridge that gap. And they might find it even offending to be called natural scientists. <laughs> they might be sort of considered hybrid uh, or transdisciplinary or, or whatsoever. So, and I'm thinking of one paper, Tipping Towards Sustainability, Emerging Pathways of Transformation, written by Francis Wesley and others, and Perlton and others, where there's uh, an honest kind of effort to bring innovation studies that I know kind of particularly better from my background at the Step Center in Sussex with resilience studies. And there I see that this is working quite well. And you see kind of hints about how power and innovation and ecological resilience are can kind of come together. So my sort of feeling is, can we, can we think about something similar in, in, in this kind of debate? Because at the moment it looks kind of polarized to me. Yeah. Can I respond to that? Thank you very much. And I'm really glad to hear there's a lot of things happening down there. Maybe I should, you know, learn more about what's happening. But um, I thought panarchy was really the, the Bible because it's still being it's still being you know referred to. But um, the, the first thing I want to respond to is is the way that we in different kinds of academic contexts deal with criticism. Now, I, I, I understand from both Gary's responses and, and some of your up to now, it's only been the resilience people who have been actually posing questions. But I, I understand that you feel that there's something uh, negative about the, the tone of this discussion. It does not lead to anything. Now, um, I'm sorry, but I come from a different academic climate where I think uh, skeptical, critical discussion is crucial to science. And we do not engage in, in island times. Now, I really recommend this article to those of you who, who would like to understand the micro-sociology of Resilient Alliance. This is an article that was published just a few weeks ago, actually, in the journal um, American Sociological Review, and it deals in detail with how the Resilience Alliance has actually maintained immunity to critique. And when you say that this criticism is not very nice, it's exactly what this article is all about. Why is criticism not nice? I thought criticism was part of the academic lifeblood, okay? But now to get back to the constructive part. Uh, I certainly agree that there are possibilities of using resilience theory in very, very, uh, I would even say subversive ways. Uh, and uh, that makes me a bit surprised that those opportunities have not been used. I remember, I think as far back as 15 years ago, using myself, Buzz Hollings' notion that the spatial and temporal scales in natural systems are aligned so that the larger, the more inclusive the spatial scale, the longer the longevity also, okay? Now, uh, if I go back to some of the work of anthropologists in the 1970s, like Roy Rappaport, for example, he argued that money was fundamentally problematic in precisely those terms because it confused levels of scale. So he criticized money and he criticized capitalism using a cybernetic systems theoretical framework. Now, with all the resources you have at your disposal at the SRC, why aren't you guys doing this? Why aren't you using a critical analysis of money to show that it's a mode of communication that actually reduces resilience? And it's the lifeblood of capitalism. I would like to see that kind of critical use of resilience theory as a political ecology instrument to, to criticize the structures that political ecologists are struggling with. Then we could really join forces. Why don't you guys do this? <laughs> okay, you, you Yeah, well, well, I think uh, maybe that's 
we'd be, we'd be colonizing your turf, and so we wouldn't want to be doing that well, now. You, would, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think, uh, uh, maybe two responses. I mean, I think there, there's, I, I would urge people to read that paper. I think it's a very interesting paper, but I think, and it's also important, important about this dynamic of creatively developing ideas and then exposing them to criticism, because as Alf knows, like, there is lots of criticism of resilience ideas, and there's also internal criticism. But, but I think what, what isn't so constructive is, or at least uh, what I maybe find disagreeable, this is sort of a persecu persecutorial tone, and I think it's not very constructive criticism. Uh, you know, what I, I want to do is I would like to make the world better. That's why I devoted my life to do this. And so, and I, I believe this is going somewhere in the sense that if you're going to do something, you need to have alternatives. That not doing something and waiting to find the best way of doing it is, is a choice, meaning you're not doing anything. And I think that's one of the main criticisms of the political ecology. It's very critical and not very constructive. It, it's looking backwards and saying this stuff is all terrible and everyone's being all oppressed. But it doesn't give answers of what to do about, about that. And I think resilience provides some tools for changing things. And I think resilience people are interested in changing things. But they're, they're interested in changing different things than, than you are. But I think there is a connection between, say, having small change to go to big changes. So maybe trying to eliminate money is not the way to actually eliminate money. You want to try and do a bunch of small things to make a social movement where you can eventually eliminate money. And I think with that kind of thing, there may be a similar connection between uh, resilience and what you're interested in. But we are going about these goals in very different ways. Uh, I think I think we are trying to do things that are actually about changing particular places, trying to change discussions. But that's also this working actually with real people in real places to try and make their lives better in some way, and better in a way that not is us picking it that they're now resilient, but they're picking it that they're resilient and helping enable them to do that. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I'm so sorry because I realize everything I say is going to sound so nasty, and I, I, I really okay. I, 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 I had a few you know question marks about this. I did originally when 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 the Stockholm Resilience Center did get the grant of 210 million kuna from Mistra. I mean, I realized that if, if if the application was about political ecology or a critical analysis of, of capitalism or money, we would not get 210 million kuna from from Mistra. So I mean, if, if we don't want to think about the ideological circumstances under which research is produced, then I don't. Then we're not reflexive. You talked about reflexivity before, and I'm saying, to what extent does the Stockholm Resilience Center and the resilience research pose a challenge to the powers that be, to capitalism, to the world market, to the forces that, in my mind, destroy our biosphere? To, to what extent do you pose a challenge? You're not even willing to look at money as a communication problem, which, which apparently, which I would argue it is. Okay, uh, okay, I'm posing, uh, I suppose, uh, provocative questions, but I suppose that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's why I was invited, I guess. Well, <laughs> can I just, uh, sorry, can I just, no, can I just, uh, you will respond, of course, you will have your time. Just, yes, um, I was going to ask, just to add to that, because I much, do much agree with that, have, um, you talked about small changes towards maybe a big change that is a real transformation then would be. Do you really think that these small changes within the box, within the system, that is not challenging anything? I, I'm sorry, I'm the moderator, I shouldn't, but this is still what I also feel. That is not challenging very much of power structures. Would that really lead them to a transition? Well, I hope so, because I think otherwise we're doomed. Um, so I, I would sort of flip it back. Do you really think critiquing the status quo actually changes anything? Well, maybe not. Yeah. So I'd say at least, at least if you change some places, you change some places, and maybe those can percolate and connect as examples. And I think something like just a, a real-world example is the one I gave of the Transitions Town movement, which is something that's spread across the world, and there's thousands of places that are engaging in transition initiatives, and and tens of, them, not hundreds of thousands of people who have mobilized for this to engage in building their resilience. They're not engaged in overthrowing capitalism, but if everyone everywhere lived in a transition town, it probably wouldn't be capitalism. So I think it's to kind of say that, well, you know, 
to say that because we don't do what you would like us to do, we're unaware that there are any problems in the world is a bit like assuming we're stupid, right? And just because we have a different strategy to do it, that's maybe a bit more where we're coming from instead of like, you can kind of think, if I can tell you, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, and are you gonna change what you're doing? But maybe if I can show you how to do it better or help you do it better, maybe you're gonna change more than just telling you're doing it wrong. It might be behind this uh, a real, uh, um, first of all, jealousy because you got so much money. Uh, the other thing, a real uh, worry that you might reproduce things instead of change, I think. That, at least in, uh, in me. Uh, but now, please, Max. Um, I was, I was uh, thinking about this question about uh, conflicting epistemologies, etc. Why not try to reach middle ground instead? And we had this discussion in Stockholm last week about that critical skepticism and the critique is an essential part of academics. And what, when, when, um, when Gary said that on the one hand we have people constructing futures, on the other hand we have people con critiquing the present, I would very much question what is your thinking about the relation between critical research and problem solving research. How is it possible to create a new future if you don't understand the present? And you understand the present not by necessarily critiquing it, but taking it apart, looking at its different parts. And it, it seems to me that your argument about that there is more and more unknowns out there, and we therefore have to be sort of adaptive, etc., etc., is a way of saying that we cannot know the future. And I would say that there are several trends concerning the relation between between natural resource management that we can very, very, very clearly see. The, land, the great land acquisitions in the third world is one of these things. We can see it, we can, we can forecast it, we can see what will happen if it will continue. And it's something that I've not seen any kind of resilience literature about. That is sort of not, about, not only about critiquing land grabbing, but it's also taking those things apart, trying to see what processes are going on there, and be prepared to meet them, not talk about that the future is unknown. Because saying that it is unknown is like preparing people to accept whatever might come. Therefore, an analyzing the present for understanding the future, for guiding the future, must be any kind of work that the social science does. What is your understanding of problem-solving research versus instrumental investigative research? Yeah, so I think obviously you need to understand the world to prepare for the future, but I think it's very, very different. And I think you have to acknowledge this to say, like, let's make a new management plan for this forest versus criticizing the way they've been doing it in the past. That's the difference I'm talking about. How do you make the plan for the future? You understand what's happened in the past and look at alternatives, explanations maybe about what's happened in the past and alternatives for the future and try and figure out if you can do better in the future. I don't know if anyone's working on, is anyone working on land grabs here? I know like at least like in Linnea's group there are people interested in it. And I think this is like, you know, we're not an infinite number of people. Uh, we can't study every topic uh, that's interest. So I think, I think it's to say that we're not interested in, we don't have some paper on land grabs when we have had multiple symposiums and, and lots of discussions about it. It's kind, it's kind of a false criticism. Was my, question was, my question was how do you see the relation between problem solving research and critical reflexive research and how they interact. Uh, I, 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 the future is to do yeah. problems for the research for the future, but how do you see how they relate? So that's I, my direct question. Okay, okay, so I think that, that I think you need to do both, and you need to have some iteration between them. And I, I, I thought I was at least trying to get at that by trying to say interaction between theory and practice. And I would suggest maybe political ecology would benefit from having some more engagement with actual trying to affect change in the real world, which is something some American political colleges have called for, at least, as actually working with stakeholders and trying to do things and make things different. Okay, please, please understand. Yeah. 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 to deliver the right answer to the right questions independently of, of who tell it. Right? Yes. Okay, so I start again. 
Uh, recently, I've heard that um, from some people that social scientists have failed to deliver the right answers to the right questions that might explain why uh, there are some problems to the funding. Uh, so I, I'm not going to defend resilient science because I, I think they deserve the criticism. But I also would like to criticize a little bit social scientists because uh, I put a lot of hopes on, 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 on your science. And recently, the questions I, I'm interested in, like how social influence affects social behavior, or how power asymmetries play a role in natural resource management, is not solved by social scientists. It's solved by physicists that take, uh, that take on, on this kind of colonialism. For example, Duncan Watts from New York University, professor of sociology, but with background in, social, in physics. James Floyd, Fowler, political science also. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my question is, uh, is to you, like, what would you say of, of theory building? Because what, what I think social sciences is talking is in describing case studies, and there's a lot of case studies. But to my mind, only a few people have been trying to develop theory a little bit further. Um, yeah. Um, conceptually. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think first of all we need to take apart the very concept of solving problems. Because problems are always defined by somebody, as we all know. And uh, I don't think it's an all it's an easy matter to say that some people are working on solving problems and some are not. Because uh, whose problems are they? Uh, I uh, I completely agree that political ecologists in, in perhaps in North America uh, are very much um, interested in contributing to, to solving problems. Uh, but perhaps they're defined somewhat differently than, than they would be in, 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 for example, in the South Resilient Center. Myself, I worked with the Mi'kmaq First Nation uh, people in, in, in Nova Scotia about 20 years ago and, and ahead. And, and I would say the work that I was doing was political ecology. They were struggling against a corporation and we were trying to make a granite quarry out of their sacred mountain. And so I, I'm not completely, you know, just lost in my, my, my books. I have been out in the field. And I would argue that the very large, extensive network of political ecologists working out there, in, not least in North America, among anthropologists, geographers, geographers and others, they are very much concerned with, with contributing to change. But I'm sure that the majority of them, and I am connected, I get their emails and their listservs and their journals, um, uh, they're, they're, they have a, a rather different definition of what the problem is. And I think that very much like I was doing with the Mi'kmaq, I was trying to support uh, political activism for change, for changing structures in, in legislation and in, in, in administration and so on. And uh, um, I, 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 I don't understand that challenge that political ecology is not concerned with those kinds of things because we certainly were then in the early 90s and even more so now. So it wasn't that you're not concerned, it's that you do anything about it, other than writing books. Um, and I, I think it's a fair criticism, because it's, it's not just my criticism, it's a criticism from within the political ecology community. Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry if I sounded nasty before, that was, that was, not, that was not very nice. Uh, I, I, I would say that, uh, no, no, I don't just sit around with books. Uh, it's a question of how we define change and doing something. And if we're the sort of the right hand of, of uh, an established administrative bureaucracy of some sort, that, that may sound like we're doing something, and the people who are critical of that bureaucracy are not doing something, they're just criticizing, but that's a very ideological statement. And uh, I would argue that doing something, from, from my political economy perspective, is exactly to get people to question and criticize the structures that say that they're doing something. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had actually a question of clarification, uh, but I also, I, to picking up on this discussion, that you've mentioned it several times, and it seems like resilient scholars are the only ones who are doing any kind of collaborative research, which I take great exception to, because there are a lot of other people doing a lot of good collaborative research in different places. So it's not only resilience, and I would say, you know, that I think it's good to know what people are doing instead of passing judgment. Uh, but what I actually wanted to ask was about transition theory, and I don't know very much about it, but from what I see that you say, you said that it, it just demonstrate the, demonstrates the power of the resilience approach. And uh, the little that I've read, which is people like Elizabeth Schroff and Gordon Walker, none of them use resilience theories, uh, I mean, yeah, resilience theory. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about how you relate to their kind of work and what transition theory really is. 
so sorry if I gave the impression that no one else is doing anything that's particularly saying political ecology. And, and, and I'm saying this is something that, I mean, there's multiple papers written by political ecologists saying that political ecologists should engage more in practice. So that, that's, so I'm just sort of reporting that. Uh, but I mean, I think a lot of resilience researchers use stuff that has been developed, particularly in, in, uh, in more sort of development studies and places like the steps, which is very rural appraisal, all these kinds of things. And I think I haven't been so involved in it, but there's, a, there's definitely this sort of Dutch, UK transition uh, theory group who, who have lots of connections with researchers at the Resilience Center who are working more on that area, with particularly, I think, like sort of Per Olson. I can't see all the students here, but I don't know if any other students are working on trans, who are here are working on transition, but definitely there are a bunch of students who are, who are trying to work together to try and see, well, what sort of interesting can they have from cross-fertilizing with each other of understanding more of these social ecological transitions versus these technical transitions, which say the Dutch group has really looked at more technological transitions. So I, I'm no expert on transition theory, but I think it's something where there are a lot of sort of parallels to some of these ideas that people have had in resilience sort of separately and now people are trying to bring them together and see how they fit. And I think, uh, as you said earlier, is uh, there are a lot of these issues about power and I think also, I, I think very interesting thinking about engineered systems, infrastructure, the built environment that have been very minimally addressed by resilience research that are very, very interesting that have been a bit more addressed in transition field, especially in the, in the Netherlands where they have a whole built country, right? Uh, and I think that's a really neat area for further development. But I, I, I'm not working on that myself. Uh, I actually a third point. Good. And, and then, uh, excuse, excuse me, excuse me. More hands in the air, please. Thank you. Which is actually it's to you, because I was thinking about, you said you came from STEPS, and I'm thinking of the work from Melissa Leach, who actually takes on things from what would be resilience theory. We call it the only political ecologists of sorts. So it's not that it, there aren't people from other sides coming and meeting and discussing these things either. So it feels that you know this debate is being a bit black and white. And I think that, uh, and I really want to, I'm glad, because you know, before I came to this and I was talking to some people and they said, oh, you know, they're going to, it's going to be the same thing with these two men. They're going to talk about their things and it's going to be the same thing over and over again. And I said, no, I mean, they're coming to this debate, I presume they would have read up on each other. And I just want to congratulate Alf that he actually showed that he's done that. So, thank you. I can go back and report. <laughs> Do you want to answer him? Yeah, so I, I know about political ecology and I've read about political ecology. <laughs> you didn't take it out like he does. So. I wasn't, that's not what I was asked to do in coming here. So I think it's, uh, I wasn't asked to critique Alf's work. I was asked to talk about resilience and, 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 and really how it relates to political ecology. And to go with your point, I, I hope I mentioned, I mentioned a whole bunch of political ecologists, as well as Melissa Leach, but, but like Carl Zimmer, like Dan Rushlow, some extent Paul Robbins. There's lots of political colleges who are engaging with resilience ideas of trying to kind of work with the bits that they can and, and try and criticize the bits they don't like. And I, I mentioned that I've made this little Mendeley group of that you can go and Google and find that has a bunch of papers that, that do that. So I think if you're interested in that, I urge you to go do that. And, and I, I'm very interested in having this engagement. And I think it's, there's this huge diversity of approaches to political ecology. And I think some of them maybe resonate more with resilience ideas than maybe, maybe than Alf's did. But I think that that doesn't mean that he should stop what he's doing or other people should stop what we're doing. But it maybe means that uh, we can kind of find some different places to work together on different topics and change what we're doing. Okay. Does this same thing work now? Yes. yes. <laughs> Hi there, French. Transition Times Uppsala. Um, I've been working with the Transition Times movement for the last three years in different countries. Um, and I'm very interested, therefore, in resilience theories because it's exactly what Transition Times is talking about. Um, but I think that it would be interesting to look at, uh, it's very good looking at fisheries and all of this, but I think that a very relevant point for people who live in cities, as most of us do, is looking at um, resilient uh, food distribution channels 
Um, the current situation is not at all resilient, as we all know, and especially in terms of peak oil and the current financial situation. Um, to give a, 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 an example of this, in, in the town of Uppsala, where I'm living, there are no greengrocers or butcher shops anywhere. If you want to buy these products, you have to go to a supermarket. Um, this is a, a, an example of some system which is not at all resilient, and it's something that I think needs to be changed. Um, the supermarkets, as we know, will run out of food in three to four days. If there's a lorry strike, if the lorries can't fill up with petrol because the price of petrol is too expensive. Um, so what my question is, is this, how can we be more proactive? Um, we, we spend a lot of time sitting around talking about these things and theoreticizing about them, but I think that we need to be proactive. And I think that Transition Times is an example of putting this into action. Um, the, the, um, Mr. Um, Holmberg mentioned earlier about um, posing a, um, a challenge to the powers that be, and I think that we need to do that. Um, I think that we need to put a lot of this talk into action. Uh, thank you very much. I, I mean, this is wonderful because I am impressed by the trans transition town movements. I've heard about the Brixton Pound, for example, and that's something that I've been harping about for years. The the way the way that you can actually create a local currency to challenge the the dominant currency, which is exactly what's happening in Brixton. So this is an excellent uh, opportunity, and here I'm really trying to be constructive, okay? This is an <laughs> excellent opportunity for the resilience theorists to look at how local currencies like the Brixton Pound uh, could actually be seen as an example of how to create resilience and at the same time challenging the capitalist structures of international food distribution and so on. You talked about local food uh, distribution. There's so many other things that those local currencies can do. Is one of the few hopes I have is that local currencies will help us solve these global problems. And I would like to see the Resilience Alliance really making more out of this, how we can change the money system. It's really a way of creating resilience, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I would really like to see more research collaboration with resilience researchers and the transition <coughs> town too, so maybe we could talk afterwards, because I know one of the things is that some resilient people from the UK have done stuff with, with uh, Transition Norwich and talking with Ron Hopkins and stuff, but it's some of the things, I think in some ways a lot of opportunity for, for mutual learning, so I think it, it's really cool thinking about multiple dimensions of resilience and putting things into practice and also understanding it as a, a social movement, I think it's very interesting as well. So, thanks. <coughs> yeah, good. <laughs> good. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Mika Palmer from Uppsala University. I would like to ask uh, at home uh, an interesting fact. It would be interesting to hear about your experiences about cross-disciplinary um, work since this is one of the major issues here. I guess that your, your, the book you talked about has a lot of experiences about current behind it. If you don't want to invade each other's areas, <laughs> how do you do? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I should add that, you know, having started up the Department of Human Ecology 20 years ago in Lund, uh, interdisciplinary work or transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary or what we want to call it, it has been a part of my, my, my work for the past 20 years. Uh, and I think uh, it is very tricky, as we all know, to, to uh, engage in discussions over disciplinary boundaries. It has to do with identity. There are existential issues involved. There are questions of having to explain every second word and, and all these things. Uh, we're probably all aware of it. Uh, but it's extremely useful and very important and uh, needs to be done. But I think a very important part of the process is to respect uh, other disciplines and not to say okay we can explain that in terms of our words you know if not this is a caricature I know but this is the kind of thing that never works in transdisciplinary communication it's extremely important to know that when when you use concepts from thermodynamics as I'm guilty of doing being an anthropologist then you really have to check with the physicists am I doing it the right way you know, and, and, and I think this is, this is a mutual respect within the academic community as a whole. And that, I think, is, is, is fundamental to any transdisciplinary effort. 
can I can I pose a follow up question on that, and then maybe a question to Gary? As you all formulate your own questions, I'm a little bit surprised that I don't know so many. So please, I encourage you. Yeah. Um, Alf, the world is not split into different disciplines, of course, and it, they will not stay exactly the same as they've always been. So, um, does that have anything to do with what you just said? I mean, is there real, what you're really critical about that people are, are doing things on other are, others' areas, or is it that you're critical to that they do it? Uh, with too little knowledge of the new field and in a bad way then? Let me, let me give an example, and that actually brings me, and I promise, to my last slide that I have prepared. Uh, <laughs> because here, here, I would add, here, here is an actual scientific issue. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. Uh, my colleagues and I, for, for, the, for the 30 years that I've been in this business, have been trying to understand exactly what you guys are calling traditional resource management systems. In other words, uh, working with the indigenous groups in all the continents and trying to understand their ethnobiology, their ways of classifying plants and animals, and so on. And uh, we do have quite a lot of competence in this area. And that's when I, when I was reading this book by Bertus and Foke, and maybe it's dated, like most of the other things I've been citing. <coughs> but it seems to be, you know, it's a Cambridge volume. You'd think it's, it's, it's basic. It's Uh, linking social and ecological systems, and I, I hope it's still, you know, uh, the date hasn't gone out. Um, so, but the question here is, um, what do we mean by traditional resource management systems? Uh, I would argue from an anthropological perspective, uh, and this is where I mean that there's not a respect for disciplinary knowledge. I would argue that the way that Berkus, you pronounce it Berks or Berkus? Burks, yeah. Burks and Folke have dealt with anthropological knowledge has not been respectful of the anthropological knowledge itself. And very much of what is written in that book uh, is not true at all. Um, the idea that indigenous peoples have pre-scientific ecosystem concepts, no. Uh, the idea that uh, indigenous peoples think of human society as part of nature, no. The evidence says the, the opposite, that they view nature as part of human society. This is, this is you know, basic anthropological knowledge over the past decades. And it seems like the, the work here that is trying to bring in anthropology is completely ignorant of what the anthropologists say. And that's why I don't think it really respects uh, the disciplines that it draws upon. Uh, this is in response to your question about what the problems are with transdisciplinary work not being respectful enough. I don't know if I should put yeah. myself first, or you... Uh, yes, I want to ask you, Gary, and not to, to make you feel uh, awkward in any way, just to, First of all, maybe, um, I think it would be a good idea, and maybe you do have, because I don't know the Stockholm Resilience Center that much, to have uh, some of the resources, uh, maybe, um, spent on um, some kind of... Uh, internal and, and together with others discussion on the ideological parts of the series. I don't know if you could put it that way or if I do it too bluntly. But do you have that now uh, within your group? Because you're, you're powerful, you, you must be aware of that. I mean, in, in terms of how many, how much resources you have and, and so forth. And uh, my fear of uh, small steps being maybe, maybe not being small steps to transition, but being um, a way to reproduce what what structures we have. That would be, of course, helped if you, if I knew that you had a, an internal debate on what ideological footprint you have in Sweden, and then maybe the yeah in Sweden would be. Do you have that? I, I'm not 100 percent. I understand the question, but but I believe I mean maybe you can ask the students, but. I mean, we have a, a series of, of internal <coughs> seminars in various different ways to kind of reflect on ideas and also have speakers from outside talk about stuff. So, so I think, I would say in some sense, we, we do. But you, the exact detail of what you said about our ideological footprint in Sweden, we've never had a, a seminar on that. <laughs> we, we don't have a common ideology, and yeah. uh, most, most departments don't. But I mean, um, being a powerful, uh, actor 
in, in uh, the scientific community of Sweden, at least. Do you have any reflections on that within your group? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think actually not so much, but in, in maybe to modify it a bit. And again, this is a chance for some students to say something different. Um, I, I think it's much more, we, we haven't had so much about in Sweden. And I think just now speaking, I am not Swedish. One of the things I've been shocked at coming from Sweden from North America is the lack of collaboration between Swedish universities. Um, so when I was a professor in, in, in Montreal, I, I had actually friends who were professors at all the other, at all four, four three other universities there. And, and we all worked together, and that's very normal, actually. And we, we had a strange thing where I, I met a former colleague of mine, also Canadian, who's moved to Lund. And we were talking, and we realized that our old geography department, geography, just the geography department, had more collaborations with Swedish universities than either of our departments in Lund or in Stockholm. Uh, so I think that's something with the Swedish academic system, and I could give a sociological analysis of why I think that is, but I, I think there are these kind of barriers to collaboration. So we have a lot of collaboration outside Sweden, and that's something that I find strange, and, and actually I think that's one of the cool things of actually getting some foreigners uh, as kind of researchers at the center, because we actually have been collaborating with other people, and we also, like say, collaborate easily with the foreigners who are at Lund, while the Swedes don't seem to uh, do that so much. And, and that's the thing, so it's gradually changing, but I think that's a real barrier to stuff in Sweden. It's very different from how stuff is typically in North America. I mean, I'll, I'll just agree, this is just my ex personal experience. Uh, I, I think they're, and, and it's definitely true that we had more collaborations uh, with other universities. Not saying your department or anything, just saying my personal experience. So I think there are some of these boundaries of how people are reproduced in the departments. Uh, yeah. But, but we, we have a lot of discussion about in research in general, but not sort of segregating Sweden no. out of that. No. Lars, and then you. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I, I asked our moderator for, for permission to, to say something. I, I want to return to, to our poster, our announcement, and uh, I want to ask you, Gary, if you sort of accept our condensed formulation of what resilience theory is all about, that it aims to analyze the capacity of social ecological systems to withstand shocks from phenomena such as environmental degradation and climate change, and to rebuild and renew themselves afterwards. Uh, for if, if, you, if you think that's a fair statement, doesn't it mean that resilience theory is more about how to, for how systems survive and, and carry on, rather than how they some, sometimes have to, to sort of radically trade, change or transform themselves and, and even become different systems? And, uh, isn't it true that in order to, to know how they rebuild themselves afterwards, uh, we have to know something about the power structure within which, or in relationship, in interaction with which they function? Uh, you know. yeah, yeah. So, so I would say, uh, so actually, if you add in this kind of reorganize uh -oh. and reorganize, I think that would make it more what we're interested in. These sort of two sides that I was also trying to talk about of sort of withstand change and reorganize in response to change, and that this change isn't just environmental. So I think, uh, like one of the things we have a bunch of students and colleagues who are working in South Africa, and they're really interested in what the the advent of democracy in South Africa has meant for resource management mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way ecosystem services are being used and the way that's rippled through ecosystems and come back into new laws. So that's sort of a social mm -hmm. change that's sort of external to the local places in South Africa. Um, and then the, the second point, I would say uh, yes, but not always. Because at least my, my approach would be is that because <coughs> something exists, of course, there are always power relations, but is that the best way to explain something, given that there's lots of things that are going on, and maybe power relations aren't the most useful thing to understand the change? 
And what's useful depends on what question you're asking. So I would just add the proviso that I don't think it's necessary to understand power relations. For example, I think economics, for example, you know, does have issues of power in it, but generally economists tend to ignore stuff. But you can understand lots of stuff using economics. You can't understand all of society, but you can understand lots of stuff. In the same way with psychology, you can understand why people make particular types of decisions. You know, there's like a Kahneman about the Nobel Prize in economics. It's really kind of more a, a, a psychologist. And they're, they're not, so, I, so I'd say you don't always need power. I have a, a concrete follow-up question. Uh, take the case of the social political system of the so what we used to call the Soviet Union. When that system collapsed, could that be understood as a case of adaptation? Well, uh, I mean, so, did, so, did so, so I, I, would, uh, I would say kind of eight, no. maybe this is just my kind of how I would approach science. I would say you could apply a lens of looking at what kind of adaptation occurred during the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that would maybe give you some interesting answers. But you could also look at other ways. And so I, I know, for example, kind of with, with the mine, mine collapse, there's a lot of social scientists who say, well, you know, the mine collapse wasn't really a collapse. It was people, lots of people walked away because it was, they were adapting to their local situation. And, is, and I, I think that's kind of missing the big picture, but it's a lens you can use to understand why people are making certain choices. That's like sort of uh, Joe, Joe Tainer, you know, would argue that it, as the situation changes, complexity is no longer useful, and so people change the way they do things. And then social systems change or collapse, but you could view that as an adaptation, you could also view it as a collapse. So that, that's... Okay. Uh, here, please yeah. raise your hand, please. And after that is yours, yes. Uh, after that is Alfa, and I think you're better with mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Ignacio Carrasco from, from uh, Sociology here in Los um, I also would like to come back to the poster and uh, grasping sustainability. And um, it's quite a simple question, but uh, what is, uh, I mean, it's obviously that uh, resilience and political ecology have a different approach to sustainable development, but uh, do you believe um, as a representative of uh, resilience and political ecology in sustainable development? And how, how do you find how do you define it and how do you work with it? The concept of sustainable development you mean within the two okay. yeah. so, so I can even skip the, the quick answer because I, I kind of had this slide arguing that I didn't think sustainability was quite as useful as sort of a resilience kind of approach. And I think Sustainable development is in some ways a useful concept, so I believe in sustainable development that way, of, of having discussions about these kind of issues. But I think, like many people do, that it's deeply problematic as well, of saying let's go and achieve sustainable development because we have no idea what that means. Uh, so I think we can kind of say let's move towards some things that we can pick some things that we want to have better or to reduce, and we can measure those things. So I feel much more comfortable with things like I'm not saying we should just do that, but like the Millennium Development Goals is sort of, sort of objective. And you can say whether you're moving towards it or not. Well, I think sustainable development is useful for discussion, but very unuseful as a, a goal. Okay, Adam. Yeah, um, I would prefer the word sustainability uh, that's good compared to sustainable development because I think the word development in itself is so difficult to handle. Uh, it's not quite as much of an oxymoron as sustainable growth but almost, uh, depending on how we define development. And I would say the conventional uh, definition of development is so loaded with particular meanings of growth of material consumption and things like this, that I would not like to use the word. In fact, some years back, uh, people argued that the word sustainable development is an oxymoron. Now they're saying sustainable growth is an oxymoron, but not sustainable development. But I would stick to just plain sustainability. We know what that is. It means that our grandchildren will be able to survive, basically, uh, and uh, you know, and, and in a more egalitarian and, and more sustainable uh, circular world. <laughs> okay. okay, it's uh, your time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm uh, Yvonne Gunnarsdotter from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences in Uppsala. Uh, 
I will, would like to come back to this, as I found, core question, not only today, but always when we discuss uh, with the concept of resilience, um, and that is the, to what extent, if I might say so, the social aspect is uh, um, studied and analyzed. And also the normative, as we've been also touching, the normative aspect, which is part of the social aspect. Um, and I understand that it's very difficult to answer this, um, especially since it's actually a quantitative question. So I would like to, to hear, maybe as a kind of answer could be, um, at the Centre of Resilience, um, how dominating is the, the, may I say, models or, or um, metaphor, the concept of resilience when when analyzing different uh, questions and, and systems. I mean, you say it's a transdisciplinary uh, environment, but how, how trans is it <laughs> when it comes to theories? I know that people working there come from different <coughs> disciplines, but uh, theories, concepts, how dominating is, is resilience? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sort of thinking. Um, and I, yeah, I think like I, I would urge uh, students uh, to, to say if they have some different idea from me. But, but I, I, I would say it's often, so, so say it this way, a lot of current research, I'd say if you had to pick the dominant idea in recent publications at the center, it's actually networks. Uh, that people are doing a lot of stuff with networks to sort of using, looking at how different people are connected together, connected to nature, looking how different bits of ecosystems are connected to people. And, and so if that's kind of a, an answer to say, I think like there's a lot of questions that people say, well, let's try and look at resilience by looking at something else. So, so it's, it's, it's sort of saying, well, we're interested in this kind of thing. We're actually going to study in detail using a whole bunch of other theoretical tools, this Thing. Um, and I, I'm just trying to think of some things um, of what people are doing. And so I, and I think there's a, a real diversity of methods that people are using. Like, so people, for example, use discourse analysis, people use complex, uh, detailed biogeochemical uh, computer models that are integrated with data to look at the Baltic, people are banding seabirds. Uh, and people are doing lots of interviews of people, and people are using GIS and landscape analysis. So I think, it, I, I'm not sure maybe if that's what you were getting at. So, so the thing is, I think that's not the same methods, not theories, but what I'm trying to suggest is that all those methods are connecting to a whole bunch of different theories that's, I, I'm sorry, sorry, I don't have, have it in my head what it is, but Olivia is one of the students. So. <laughs> So I'm Olivia, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Human Geography of Stockholm University and in the Resilience Center, so it's possible to survive between those two. And uh, I'm working in a project that has uh, geographers and uh, systems ecologists and about the theories and concepts. For instance, as geographer, I have no problem of using ecosystem services in my geography. My understanding, I talk about local natural resources, but ecosystem services is so close that there is no, is that if we, there is no point in discussing it. My supervisor right now is writing an article trying to merge land, land desk capital and ecosystem, ecosystem services and see how those two um, concepts can communicate and if there is something that is, could be shared in between them instead of just opposing them. I'm, um, I'm working with time. I am uh, doing a um, couple of human environment on timelines. So, and I'm working as well in complex system at the same time. And there's so far no contract. Matt is my main supervisor, by the way. And so far he hasn't contradicted anything about my work trying to use um, the loop of adaptation system to explain uh, food crisis and uh, social uh, coping strategy reorganization in the Sahel while applying geographical methods at the same time. I don't know if I'm very clear, but there is no contradiction in using uh, both approaches. 
to create a greater understanding of one situation uh, on a case study for my, my, uh, my work. I don't know later if I can expand it to a more theoretical level, but so far, so good. <laughs> We have very little time left, and uh, okay. I'll shortly, and then Gary shortly. Right. Uh, I think I will be able to connect to Yvonne's important question, the extent to which the uh, models used by the resilience people is actually transdisciplinary. And I think the answer is it can be found in this article by, by Parker and Hackett, published, uh, like I said, a few weeks ago, and I recommend it, because what this article uh, shows is that the the social processes uh, through which the Resilience Alliance, and I would believe also the Resilience Center actually, has been uh, generated are very exclusionary, and that the people who are invited to these islands have to be nice, not critical, like me. Uh, they have to be um, in general agreement, and they should be fine. And uh, so uh, the article is all about how very uh, exclusive this social selection of people are. And of course, if everybody agrees on that a line down eight can explain everything, then of course it, it has to be a rather exclusive process. Now, I'm going to finish off because I'm supposed to be brief with a question posed in this article. And I'd like to put that question to Gary. Uh, and it goes like this. In which phase of the adaptive cycle is the Resilience Alliance right now? Uh, it's in a reorganization phase. It is? Yeah. It so it's collapsed? Work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I didn't know. I, I, didn't, didn't, get, I didn't get that impression. But, it has <coughs> but, but, but uh, another way of saying it is that it's uh, at the steam. And so it's so one of the arguments for the resilience science is do we even need to have the resilience science because there's a bunch of centers around the world that have been successful. There are clusters of people doing resilience research. And of course, those centers are not violence. They're all embedded in universities. and. Uh, I'm sure John Parker would, would agree that if uh, that because people agree on some basic principles as a refrained thing, and then have some trust, then there's criticism within that. So saying, well, let's have strong criticism within this area, and let's not criticize outside. So I, I also urge people to read that article. It's a, it's a really interesting article. Um, but to think that people so say I think you got like say Brian Walker and, and uh, Buzz Holling up here and said like explain the adaptive cycle you would see quite a lot of criticism of two guys who've known each other for a long time and are friends with each other, but they, they really quite disagree about the adaptive cycle, and they publish papers about it. So I, I, I would ar I sort of say that for that, I think there, there's, there's, there, of course, is a role for critique. And if you recall, actually, at the beginning, my first thing, I, I actually said that something that resilience maybe needs is more critique. But what I, I would urge is sort of say, what I think is more useful is more accurate critique, like to actually criticize what we actually do, not what maybe uh, you think we do. Uh, and I think that's the thing with the ecological cybernetics. And so I really don't feel that's that's what we're doing. And may, but I mean, of course, you're feel free to criticize that. But it's it's more productive for us to have criticisms of what we actually do and actually respond to. Uh, and I think the adaptive cycle is something that has a lot of internal criticism, we can have a lot more. I think this issue of something of, of we didn't get to, but general, I, I'm not going to, you can even say which of these questions are interesting, so I'm going to give some self-critiques for resilience. General versus specific resilience, we didn't have this, and I didn't put it in there, but generally an idea of resilience is of what to what. So you can look at the same thing, like say, just say um, a city, and say, is that city resilient? And is it resi resistant to SARS, resilient to SARS? Is it resilient to uh, uh, an oil shortage? Is it resilient to a meteorite? We don't kind of really know so well, but we're interested in like, are there kind of more, is there a general resilience that gives you resilience to everything? Or are there very specific types of resilience? Are there trade-offs between if you become more resilient to one thing, you become less resilient to other? There's some theory from uh, highly optimized tolerance from engineering that suggests that might be the case, but maybe that's not true in non-engineering systems. But people, some people are working on this. Um, and I think this other issue, too, is this issue of, of sort of scale. And I'll, I'll try to talk, talk about this and think that's something that we do agree on. And the scale is very interesting. Of that, obviously, it's important, but it's really difficult to grapple with. Of, of that, how, 
so one of the things that's a real challenge is how do you do anything? So you, you've got so much ability, time to concentrate on things. And so if you're trying to understand a system and what it's connected to and what it's constituent of, there's too many variables to make sense of all. So you need to have a cut. But then what's the right cut if all these things are interacting? And that's a real challenge. And of course, where people make progress is where they've been able to find good cuts. And I think to think of novel ways of looking at these connections between systems is something that's really neat. And then maybe something that is specific, and I think hopefully is more positive, is say that there's been a lot of this internal discussion of that we need to think more about power and how to think about power in, in the Resilience Alliance. And people have tried to do some stuff with it, I think in various different ways. And so one kind of indirect way I personally did stuff is I, I've done research on inequality and how inequality affects various environmental outcomes. So that's obviously not power, but I can actually do something with inequality. And so I think that's something that a lot of resilience research would be really interested in, is sort of operational techniques to look at power. And there, I think I can fairly say that there, there's a bunch of graduate students who've been trying to do this, and they get pieces of it. But the trouble is, I think, especially if you go across the social sciences, there are very, very different models of power. You get maybe, you know, Marxian and Foucaultian, and, you know, someone else talked about it. They, they have very different ways of analyzing things and think about it. And to kind of hook into that is really a challenge. So I think to have kind of clear discussions of how to kind of engage methodologically and operationally power with people would really, really like that. Uh, and we really like to work with people colleagues on that. Okay, I think we have to draw the line here because it's over five. Uh, thank you all for coming. And thanks to Gary and thanks to Al for coming and debating this issue.